Thanks very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in the centre of Europe. Um, I think you probably all know this Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. And um, I think that two of the major things that make our times interesting, in that rather nasty sense, um, are um, populism on the one hand uh, and polarisation, which I think go together. So populism, I think, has definitively now become the language of politics. So there's a sense in which even people, you, and parties and, and politicians that you wouldn't think of as populists are increasingly shifting in a populist direction. Um, and the polarisation, I think you can see it clearly in the British case where the UK remains absolutely 50-50 divided. Uh, over the issue of Brexit. I mean, the proportions have shifted very, very slightly from a, a slight majority to leave the European Union to a slight majority to remain in it. But, you know, it's too close to call. Uh, the pollsters will say, you know, it's within the margin of error. And the same polarisation you get with Trump, I think, in the US, um, or uh, with Erdogan, um, and um, in Poland, for example, between... Um, peace and the opposition, and perhaps in this country too. Um, and this is bad for the European Union because the European Union doesn't do populism. Uh, its politics is based on uh, consensus, compromise, uh, sometimes dirty compromise, but compromise nonetheless, and it really can't handle um, this shift towards populist politics, I think. Um, when Stuart and I were colleagues in the School of European Studies at Sussex University, I was very interested in Europe uh, and teach, spent half my time teaching about Europe, but not very interested in the European communities. Uh, it seemed very technical, detailed, uh, economistic and so forth, legalistic as well. And um, what really made me a partisan of European integration wasn't so much seeing the European institutions, though that, that kind of helped and got me more interested in them, but it was Mrs. Thatcher. And uh, I suddenly realized, or came to believe, that we needed European integration, some sort of framework which would put a control on rogue politicians, uh, as I saw her, like uh, Thatcher. Um, so the context of this, um, talk, I've just mentioned there um, a piece by Jan Jimski that he wrote for a, an issue of Discover Society, an online blog magazine, uh, and I edited that particular issue, having done one earlier just on the, the, the day after the, uh, the Brexit referendum. So if, if you're really interested in ancient history, you can scroll back through Discover Society to that. But what Jan argues there in relation to Poland is that there are two ways of, as it were, de-Europeanising. De One, uh, the British way, where you say, OK, we're leaving, slam the door. Uh, unfortunately, you've left all your belongings behind and you can't actually leave the door, or you can't check out of Hotel California, um, if you know that old song by the Eagles. Um, the other way is to stay in, uh, the Polish-Hungarian way, where you say we want to remain in the European Union, but we want to trash the um, institutions, the, the rule of law, uh, freedom of, of uh, press and so forth, all of the, the, the European uh, institutions. Um, so what th this piece that Jan, um, Jan is at uh, the Wazowski University in Warsaw, this then escalated into a special issue of a journal which he and Russell Foster are editing and the talk, uh, um, this talk is based on a longer paper which I'm happy to send if, if you're interested uh, on uh, de-Europeanisation, narrowing and shallowing. Um, so one of the many misleading slogans, I think, of the Brexiters in the UK is that the UK is leaving the European Union but not leaving Europe, um, which is true geographically, of course, but occludes the, the breaking up of a whole set of practical and ideational ties with the rest of Europe. And it's worth remembering, perhaps, that this isn't just a problem of the European Union, <laughs> Uh, that Mrs May's initial hostility when she was Home Secretary before she became Prime Minister 
was against the European human rights regime rather than the EU, and um, it's quite possible that the UK, uh, if the Conservatives remain in power, will want to withdraw also from um, the Convention on Human Rights. Um, in, in relation to the, U the, the EU, um, you get the extreme kind of fantasy notion, at least in the early stages of the last two years, um, that the UK could create a sort of offshore economy like Hong Kong, Singapore or Georgia with unilateral free trade relying primarily on financial services. And um, the downside of that, of course, uh, would be that uh, agriculture would close down, uh, manufacturing and what's left of it would also close down. Uh, there'd be a huge surplus population which would have to be managed in some sort of more or less authoritarian way. Um, on the brighter side, I mean, is there a happy Brexit? Um, you can just about, I think, conceive of the sort of um, Corbynite uh, Brexit scenario of egalitarianism, wonderful welfare provision, uh, full employment, social tolerance, and so on. But I don't see that being economically viable in the UK, in, which is so plugged into the, uh, the world economy. So we missed our chance in the UK of becoming Norway uh, when we blew the money coming out of North Sea oil on uh, unemployment benefit rather than um, investment. So Norway put it into a state fund, the <coughs> British uh, Conservative government, the previous one, uh, cut taxes, cut, cut, cut taxes uh, ran a boom and uh, frittered the money uh, away. Um, what's the rationale for Brexit? I, I won't go into the details of it, but uh, you certainly get people increasingly saying, um, Mrs May is starting to say this, that it's the EU which threatens national democracy, which she's been saying for a long time, and that, that populist politics is produced by the European Union. And you know, if you try to stop Brexit, um, you know, God help you, because populism will uh, enormously rise, uh, as though populism had not been kind of stirred up by the, the Leave campaign. Um, now, the... I mentioned European values a moment ago, and I, I think it's important to avoid the sort of self-congratulatory discussion of that um, in the way that people talk about un-American in the Committee of Un-American Activities. Um, so, for example, capital punishment, I want to say, is, is non-European because uh, the European uh, human rights regime excludes capital punishment, not so it's a legal provision, even if it's based on, on underlying uh, values. Um, what do we mean by Europeanization? I think we mean not just the acquis communautaire, but related practices, a whole range of norms, practical understandings, and so forth. Um, it also means, Europeanization means the interaction of national institutions with European ones, uh, what's sometimes called vertical integration, uh, or with equivalent institutions in other national states uh, in a European context, horizontal integration. So vertical integration, uh, national ministers meeting in the council, national civil servants <coughs> participating in the commission, judges and advocates general and their staff in the, the Court <coughs> of Justice. Um, and um, leaving the EU means, means breaking off all of these vertical links uh, and removing the, the structures of horizontal interaction. So for a third country, uh, interaction with, with the European Union becomes a matter of foreign ministries. You're, you're no longer kind of linked in to, to all of that. Uh, Europeanisation, for obvious reasons, gets discussed in relation to, to transnationalisation. So it's worth asking whether de-Europeanisation entails de-transnationalisation, uh, or what elements of the transnational persist outside the EU framework. Um, so if you think of Europeanisation, um, 
I mean, one of the things I want to I talk about, I mean, it's the kind of underlying theme of my book on contemporary Europe, is really that, that the integration process is partly institutional and partly external to the institutions. So air traffic, for example, is partly, uh, in Europe, is partly underpinned by uh, a European Union uh, 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 regime, but also by um, cheap budget airlines, which are essentially a, a US invention taken over into Europe and transformed uh, travel um, in across, across Europe. Um, so de-Europeanization, um, I mean, people talk about soft and hard Brexit. I think you can also talk about soft and hard de-Europeanisation, the first being a process where a member state diverges from the general European pattern, either through some sort of opt-out derogation uh, or through gradually and sometimes surreptitiously abandoning European norms, and the second case, the hard case of uh, withdrawing entirely in the UK example or deciding not to, to join the EU uh, possibly the Turkish example. And in both cases, I think you can see quite uh, unpleasant uh, anti-EU propaganda, propaganda against um, independent judiciary, uh, against parliamentary institutions, uh, and so forth. Um, I'll spare you a discussion of uh, Nordic countries, but uh, it's worth mentioning that even if you're not uh, a member of the European Union, as in the Norwegian or Swiss case, you're still part of transnational regulation uh, through the World Trade Organization uh, and so on. So the Brexit fantasy is, is really just that. Um, I think one should need, what about opt-outs, uh, if you like, this sort of softer version of de-Europeanisation, the taking back of certain sorts of powers, um, and the uh, open method of coordination is, is the kind of jargon term uh, for describing that uh, form of, of um, uh, differentiated or flexible in integration. Um, it seems to work quite well in the Danish case, uh, which has got a number of opt-outs. Uh, in the British case, I think it, it was part of this kind of rather dangerous slide uh, into the Brexit process, which incidentally the book that's sort of moving around the room, which I edited on Brexit, um, is, is describing, um, particularly the, the, the first chapter covers that. Um, I won't say and think anything about deconstitutionalization and constitutionalization, but um, one way of that, that that's relevant, I think, if you're interested in the legal aspect of all of this, is that uh, the regularization of opt-outs uh, might be a preferable system to the current kind of rather ad hoc um, uh, setup. Um, Disintegration, differentiated integration, I think, are, are not the same, but they may, you know, how they relate um, is fairly open. Um, <clears throat> it's worth making the point, uh, I shouldn't go on much longer, but both Europeanization and de Europeanization, I think, destabilize the existing constitutional <coughs> arrangements of the member states. Um, and again, in the British case, you can see this um, in which uh, agricultural policy, for example, uh, where do the, assuming Brexit happens, which I have a, I'm becoming slightly more optimistic that we might, might just about get away without it, but, um, you know, the, the, the odds are still stacked very firmly in favour of uh, it happening. Uh, if it does happen, uh, what do you do with agricultural policy? Do those powers go from Brussels to London, or do they go also to Edinburgh, to Cardiff, uh, to Belfast, to the regional uh, or sub-national uh, components of the UK? And other issues, again, um, massively uh, you know, destabilizing the uh, settlement. The Irish border is the most dramatic case. You know, 
We could imagine the Irish civil war restarting uh, as a result of Brexit. We could imagine, in a happier scenario, uh, a united Ireland as a result of it. Um, you know, those, those are open possibilities. Um, so you may think this is just a British problem and the British have gone crazy, and I agree. Um, but the British problem does have, I think, a more general um, significance. What it demonstrates is the insuperable obstacles uh, which Antje Wiener in, the chapter, in her chapter in the book that's, that's going around um, discusses in some detail, the obstacles to disentangling the links formed by membership, even if uh, you happen to be like the British outside the Eurozone and outside the Schengen area. Um, So it's destabilizing those arrangements. It's also destabilizing, in the, the particular case of de-Europeanization, marginalizing the UK Parliament, marginalizing the ju judiciary. Uh, you might have seen a, a headline in a um, British newspaper describing three High Court judges, Supreme Court judges, as enemies of the people. I mean, that kind of language um, very much um, straying into British political discussion. Um, so I think that means that de-Europeanisation à l'anglaise is going to be, remain a, a negative example for other member states, as you can see in uh, <coughs> poll results just after the, the Brexit referendum. Um, but a more likely outcome is a further extension of, of policies which don't directly challenge the EU but attempt to evade or water down its arrangements. So it's a bit like if you know Colin Crouch's wonderful book on post-democracy, which he wrote in Berlusconi's Italy. Um, um, so democracy is, isn't replaced by a sort of Nazi-style Machtergreifung. It's undermined in more surreptitious ways, as it was by Berlusconi, and is, is you know, happening uh, in other uh, states as well. Um, and that... You know, you can see how that would happen in the EU itself, drifting away from transnational approaches to further development of open coordination, uh, ad hoc agreements. Um, what Jürgen Habermas, following a number of legal theorists, has called executive federalism. So deals done uh, by um, state heads of state and government. Uh, and a weakening of uh, European uh, methods. Whether that's a permanent change of course for the European polity or whether it's just the sort of back and forth movement that you get in all federal systems um, remains to be seen. There's good survey evidence, a nice piece by, by Catherine de Vries, um, suggesting that European, union, uh, European opinion tends to favour a more flexible and selective approach uh, a somewhat less transnational European Union with more popular input through referendums uh, focused on peace and security and economic growth rather than energy security or climate change. I don't know how you have economic security without worrying about climate change, but um, that's the, the way European opinion seems to be at present. Um, and there's no support, interestingly, particularly from this part of the world, for the most dramatic form of narrowing, the return to a smaller Europe, uh, a smaller Europe of six members or 15 members, uh, a return, a sort of westernisation of, of the EU. No support for that. Um, all this suggests, I think, that the central issue will be the further development of the Eurozone, um, about which I'm completely incompetent to talk about, but Stuart will be <laughs> possibly talking about. Um, um, in one scenario, at least, I'm just, just venture one remark about it. In one scenario, this drives the, the European <coughs> Union in a kind of federal direction, whether or not the European public are particularly enthusiastic about that development. Um, and Anthony Giddens has argued um, in a book in 2013 along those lines. Um, he's kept rather quiet in the Labour discussion because he doesn't hesitate to use the F word in his book and no doubt would uh, still be committed to a, a federal Europe. Um, the alternative is that the Eurozone might b become a kind of core of the Union, which to some extent it is already, with a larger, more fragmented outer circle. And again, you might see that scenario as a realistic accommodation to political reality, to economic reality, 
Um, or you might see it as seriously damaging uh, form of de-Europeanization in a context which is increasingly dominated by populism, but also nationalism, uh, xenophobia, and so on. So European integration began at a time when this kind of nationalist politics had just wrecked the continent, and we have to confront, I think, the possibility that it may succumb to it again. Sorry to bring the bad news. <laughs> Thank you very much.